For the first talk in the afternoon session, we're very happy to have Henry Lynn to tell us about algebra and geometry from Florida. Thank you so much to the organizers. Uh, this paper will, this talk will be based on a paper that I wrote in August, uh, as well as some upcoming work with uh, Douglas and Zender. Okay, so let's start with uh, two equations. The first one equates the partition function of gravity with the partition function of quantum field theory. And the second one equates their Hilbert space. And wouldn't it be nice to have a microscopic derivation of these equations? Uh, by that I mean starting from just the UV definition of the theory uh, and just doing some transformation without any input from knowledge about string theory. Now, that's a hard problem and I don't know how to do it. I don't even know how to define uh, the right-hand side in either of these equations, at least uh, in some complicated models of holography. Okay. However, uh, we can retreat a little bit from this problem and ask this question in SYK. And the reason why this is a retreat from the problem is because the first equation is already derived. So that's the famous G sigma action. Uh, and it's analogous to, let's say, the Einstein action, only in the sense that uh, 1 over n appears in the same way uh, that G Newton appears. Probably don't need to do that. Now, uh, that motivates the question of whether we can understand the second equation in SYK. Right? The second equation is, in a large part, the topic of the it from qubit. So, uh, one immediate problem, well, one immediate idea is that you might think, well, let me just cut open the GN sigma action uh, and use a path integral to define states, similar to uh, how I would do it uh, in a field theory. But this immediately runs into a problem. And the problem is that uh, G and sigma are non-local. So uh, this immediately fails. Um, but there's a different limit of SYK called the double scale limit, which was uh, analyzed by a lot of people, uh, especially for Guzman and company, um, who, uh, who developed a new technique for understanding SYK using these so-called core diagrams. And uh, using these so-called core diagrams, we'll be able to make some progress in understanding the second equation. Uh, this is an interesting solvable limit of SYK that enhances certain quantum effects and suppresses other effects. So for example, the chaos exponent is finite in this model. So that's a bit like uh, having stringy effects, perhaps, or sophisticated models. OK, uh, we can actually say a bit more about the bulk to boundary map. But uh, instead, today, we'll be focused on an algebra of operators that acts on this Hilbert space, bulk Hilbert space. And we'll try to understand why uh, there's a finite temperature Lyapunov exponent in a certain regime, uh, as well as understand the bulk isometry. So what are the symmetries of the bulk space-time uh, from just a microscopic description of SYK? So let me start by a quick review of JT gravity. JT gravity is described by a particle and a potential. We heard a little bit about that in, in the last talk. And the idea is that the length of the particle, uh, the length of the wormhole is described by the position of the particle. So if you know about particles and potentials, you know about JT gravity. Okay. So uh, the, the the fact that there is a potential that's e to the minus l explains why the wormhole grows, for example, at late time. Now, uh, uh, the classical motion just involves scattering off of this potential. So at early times, we start with a very long state. It reflects off the potential at t equals zero, and then goes back uh, at very late time. And that's the classical motion. We can also continue at t equals zero to the Euclidean signature. Okay, when we continue to Euclidean signature, we flip the sign of the potential, and uh, the Liouville wall becomes a Liouville cliff, and that describes the thermal field double becoming uh, ending at the bottom of the disk. Okay. Now, uh, now that you know all there is to know about uh, pure JT gravity in the gauge invariant formalism, uh, classically, now we can move on to quantum mechanics. The uh, quantum mechanical solution of this particle and the potential can be obtained uh, using standard uh, undergrad textbook method. You get these scattering states. And we could say in pure JT gravity that the bulk Hilbert space at the level of the disk is just a span of these wave functions. Okay. So this is a two-sided bulk Hilbert space. Um, and I emphasize that it is the Hilbert space associated with two entangled quantum mechanics. It is not the Hilbert space of the single quantum mechanic. Um, and this is also another caveat is that this is without matter. So when we include matter, the story is much richer, and we'll discuss this later. Now, despite just saying that it's the two-sided Hilbert space, I will now say that you can compute the one-sided partition function of gravity using the two-sided Hilbert space. Okay. So um, how you do that is 
you use the observation that the disk has two points where the link between the two sides of the wormhole is zero. Okay. There, those are obviously any two points, but for convenience, we can take them to be the south pole and the north, north pole. And then we write the disk partition function as an amplitude between the link equals zero state at the bottom and the link equals zero state at the top you know, uh, using the Euclidean property. Okay, so as a simple exercise, you can use the eigenfunctions that I just showed in the previous slide to derive the cinch square root of E density of states that you're probably familiar with. Okay. Now, um, uh, we'll, uh, the reason why I'm reviewing this formalism in this particular way is that in SYK, all of the natural variables are gauge invariant. So you'll notice that I have not discussed the metric or the dilaton, and that's because uh, to make connection with SYK, we need to talk about quantities that are intrinsically diffeomorphism invariant. All right, now let's review double scaled SYK. So this is the SYK Hamiltonian. The double scaling limit uh, is Q goes to infinity, where Q is the number of fermions in the interaction, and goes to infinity uh, with this quantity lambda being helpful. And there are two dimensionless quantities in this theory. There's lambda, and then there's beta j. Okay. The standard large Q limit is lambda going to zero with fixed temperature. That is the limit, for example, where the chaos exponent can be finite. So it can be maximal at very low temperatures, uh, or it could be finite at higher temperatures. There's also the triple scaling limit where we send lambda to zero, beta j to infinity, holding this combination of quantities fixed. Okay, that's basically the inverse Schwarzschild coupling, and that uh, in this limit we expect to recover JT graph. Now, um, the observables uh, in this theory were discussed by Bertuzzi et al., and they are these random operators. So I'm here. I'm using a multi-index notation where psi is a product of uh, fundamental and k here is a set of random couplings. So it's very similar to the Hamiltonian, except for these couplings k are independent of the couplings that appear in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so all the observables, including the Hamiltonian, are just random operators, random focus. Now, Bercuse and company have, in a series of remarkable papers, completely solved the model. And that means that they've computed the partition function and all thermal correlation functions. Okay, so the final answers in these papers uh, involve these cutiform gamma functions. And uh, given that they completely solved the model, you might wonder what else is there to talk about? Why am I uh, talking right now? And the answer is that uh, we want to understand their solution in a bulk language. So, so that's the main motivation for uh, what I'm trying to do. Okay, so um, in order to explain the connection to the bulk language, I want to first review the computation of z of beta. So the steps are actually extremely elementary. You can definitely follow it uh, if you know just sort of basic quantum mechanics. And the idea is that you tailor expand e to the minus beta h. You then focus on a particular term in the tailor expansion. Okay? And uh, a particular term, let's say h to the fourth, will involve some Wick contractions once you do the disorder app. Right? So you draw a bunch of Wick diagrams like you were taught. And the Wick diagrams just keep track of the indices uh, that appear after you do the disorder act. Okay. So here there's ii and jj. Okay, then to evaluate the trace that remains, you just use the Majorana algebra. So you just use the fact that psi i squared equals one. So at the end of the day, this whole thing gives you either plus or minus one, depending on the particular values of the indices. Okay. So um, whether you get a plus or minus one depends on whether there are an even number or an odd number of fermions in common between these two sets of indices. So the trick is that in the double scaling limit, you can uh, forego keeping track of the exact plus or minus ones and just replace that with the average value of the phase, plus or minus one. And that can be computed easily, and it's e to the minus lambda. So the rule is um, that every time you see this width contraction, you just need to keep track of intersections and insert this factor of e to the minus lambda every time you move i past j, which is the same thing as having an intersection in the middle of this diagram. Okay, and then the final step is the sum over width contract. So this can be summarized by uh, a set of diagrammatic rules, and that's what the chord diagrams are. So uh, the idea is that we sum over all chord diagrams, which are just, remember, the width contraction diagrams that you were taught to draw. And for each intersection vertex, we write down a factor of Q. So this is some particular contribution to the thermal partition function, where uh, uh, there are six intersections in the book, so you get a Q to the six. Okay. 
Uh, and the final trick is to figure out how to enumerate all possible chord diagrams. And we do this by uh, uh, using a, the transfer matrix uh, trick that they introduced. Now, the idea is uh, to make contact with JT gravity, we slice open the chord diagrams in some particular way. So given any particular chord diagram, you can find some location where there are no chords passing through this red slice. And then as we advance uh, in either the left or right direction, we consider what happens when uh, we insert a value of, when we insert H, the Hamiltonian. So that defines some transfer matrix. And as you can see, uh, it's very suggestive that this equation is related to the equation that I wrote before in JT graph. Now, this immediately suggests uh, that the core number plays the role of link in uh, the double scale theory. And that's in fact correct. So the uh, core number is some discrete integer, whereas the link is uh, a continuous variable, but in some particular limits, they're going to agree. Now, to make this more explicit, we need to work out the specific form of P. So in principle, we have two operators, the left Hamiltonian and the right Hamiltonian. Remember that this is a two-sided uh, way of thinking about it. However, without matter, these operators are identical. And so we just need to consider, for example, the action of uh, the right Hamiltonian. And the right Hamiltonian can do two things. It can either create a chord or annihilate a chord. If it creates a chord, uh, that's accounted for by writing down this alpha dagger. If it annihilates a chord, well, uh, one of, you know, it can either annihilate three chords, like in the picture above, or it can annihilate two chords, or it can annihilate four chords, et cetera. So we need to sum over the number of chords that it, could, that it passes through uh, while it's being annihilated. And that is the sum here. That gives you what's known as a cutiform integer. It's just one minus q to the n over one minus q, but this thing is called the cutiform integer in the math tradition. Okay, so that's the expression for the transfer matrix. If you then just solve the transfer matrix, as Bertuz and company did, you can work out the partition function and uh, more, uh, more, properties of, uh, more properties of the system. However, we can also include matter. And the only minor modification is that the Feynman rules are modified so that uh, you have black chords, which are the Hamiltonian chords, and these green chords, which represent these matter operators. And uh, the intersection vertices are modified so that instead of just having e to the minus lambda, you have e to the minus lambda times delta, for example, when there's a cross between them. And the fact that uh, the thing that appears in the exponent is proportional to the masses or the sizes uh, times the Newton's constant is can think of as a 2D version of the Newton's constant. So the Hilbert space discussion uh, in the case with matter is a little bit richer. So instead of just having one core number, uh, you actually have two core numbers, for example, if there's one matter particle. So there's the number of cores to the left of the matter particle, this green chord, or the number of chords to the right. Okay. So uh, then you have two kinds of creation and annihilation operators, alpha dagger right and alpha left. Okay, But you see that the structure is very similar. So again, uh, acting with a right Hamiltonian, you can either create a chord or annihilate a chord. So the creation operator gives you this alpha dagger. The annihilation, uh, now you can annihilate the right chord or you can annihilate the left chord. If you annihilate the right chord, you just get a factor of this q to form integer wr. Um, and if you annihilate the left chord, well, you have this factor of q to n right because you have to cross all possible right chords. Okay. So the, the, the summary is that you just need to know about some combinatorics in order to figure out uh, these transfer matrices. And it's extremely elementary combinatorics. And uh, for general states with uh, m particles, you can obtain some expressions. The Hilbert space then involves m chord numbers instead of just uh, you know, two or one. Okay. The only feature I want you to remember is that the right Hamiltonian only involves a single creation operator, alpha dagger right. You can only create uh, a, a chord on the right using p right. It never creates a chord on the left, for example, or one of the middle. That was a convention that we used to define the transfer matrix, but it's going to be important later. Now, so far, I've only discussed a bulk vector space. So it's a span of a bunch of these vectors. Um, in order to make it a Hilbert space, I need to specify the inner product. So the inner product um, will also help us facilitate contact with JT gravity. And it is simply defined by this equation. So the idea is that you view the overlap between, you view this transition amplitude as an overlap between states. Okay? And this gives you some equation for the inner product. Now, it's more illuminating to write that equation geometrically. And that equation says that you can split a general chord diagram into three regions. 
a bottom region, which defines a cat vector, a top region, which defines a bra vector, and some middle region, which defines the inner product. The rule is that all chords entering the bottom of the middle region, so this line gamma n, must exit through the top. That defines the inner product. And using this definition, you can write down a recursion relation and in some cases solve it uh, to obtain an expression for what the inner product is. Now, when you do that, you can uh, use it to compute the P matrix now in an orthonormal basis. And when you do so, you get this expression. So this is some expression where I've defined a new variable L, which is lambda times N, and uh, K is the momentum that's conjugate to L. So if you then take the triple scaling limit, which in this context means you take length to infinity, lambda to zero, but holding this quantity fixed, okay, you recover on the nose the JT Hamiltonian. Right? Okay, so this is a microscopic derivation of say, of this formula. Uh, this was already um, to some extent pointed out in the Bercuse paper, uh, but we can redo it now with matter. And what's interesting is, for example, with the single particle, we get these other expressions for the left and right Hamiltonian and the left and right links, uh, we'll get some expressions which uh, were not known even in JT graph. Okay. Um, uh, as you can see, it, the general case will give you some sort of scattering problem, but now instead of being a one dimensional scattering problem, it's now some m plus one dimensional scattering problem where you have m plus one coordinates corresponding to the various different links inside the world. Okay. Now, let me just comment now on the microscopic interpretation of the chord number. So, uh, in general, there's this notion of uh, operator size. So, you can take any two sided state and expand it in the basis of fundamental fermions. And you can write uh, the state with, in this particular form. So, here C S sub i is the uh, size wave function. And the size in general, which acts on the state by multiplication by s, is just uh, accomplished by this operator here. Okay, so this was discussed in uh, Stryker and Chi. And uh, it's a very simple exercise to check that using this definition and the chord rules that the size operator is actually given by n bar, so the, the, the total chord number, uh, up to this factor of q. And this simply says that each of those open chords that, that we were cutting uh, is an operator of size q, which of course makes sense, right? These uh, individual operators are just Hamiltonians and they are a product of Q fermions. So uh, it makes sense that uh, we have this relationship. Now, let me turn to the chord algebra. So the question is, what should I do with these expressions that I had for T left, T right, uh, and N bar? Okay. So one thing you can do is just start taking commutators of this. And to motivate that, I, I should say that in JT gravity, uh, we would like to under, well, in general, we would like to understand the symmetries of the bulk. That's sort of the zeroth order question that you might want to know about in holography, right? What are the symmetries uh, of ADS, for example? And do they match something in the CFP? So uh, in ADS2 or nearly ADS2, that's actually a somewhat subtle question. So the gauge invariant symmetries, they do not commute with the Hamiltonian. So you need a slightly more complicated discussion, and that's what we're going to discuss here. So um, uh, this, but you, the way you get these symmetries is by essentially just taking commutators. So first thing that you can check is that the commutator between t left and t right is zero. Uh, that's completely obvious because you know, because h left and h right act on uh, different factors of the Hilbert space. But it's actually not obvious from the expressions that I wrote down. The expressions that I wrote down involve alpha dagger left and alpha dagger right and so forth. And it's actually non-trivial to check that that holds. But uh, you can check that. And similarly, you can check all these other relations. OK. Now, if you stare at this expression for a little bit, you'll recognize, if you read uh, Harlow and Wu, that this is some sort of Q deformation of the JT gravitational algebra. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, information in uh, these sets of equations, and the rest of the talk will be trying to extract a little bit of this information from this algebra. OK, so one thing that you can uh, look for is the symmetries of the bulk. And how you find the symmetries is you look for operators in this algebra that commutes with the chord number, the total chord number, which we interpreted as the length of the wormhole in the JT limit. So you can find four such operators, and you find them very simply. Uh, so alpha dagger left is part of the algebra, and so is alpha dagger right. Okay, they appear, for example, here. Right? And uh, those create a single chord. 
So if you can multiply it by an annihilation operator, you could get something which does not change the chord number. Now, um, this is why you needed to remember that he left contained a factor of alpha dagger left, but no factors of alpha dagger right. So this expression P left minus alpha dagger left only contains annihilation operators. Okay, so these expressions are just one creation operator and some superposition of annihilation operators. So they manifestly commute with the total coordinate. So these are four things. Uh, you can compute their algebra. But in order to compute their algebra, it's more convenient to first uh, redefine them slightly by shifting away uh, some function of the total link, which commutes with this. So it's allowed thing to do. And you can define H's then, which are just these rescaled versions of S. Okay, so now we can state what the uh, result is for this algebra. It's given by these sets of equations. Um, the quantity here, C, is just the exponential of the link. Uh, the link is defined by lambda times the coordinate. Okay. Uh, so you see that this appears in the algebra in some particular way, and we can simplify it a bit further by uh, further shifting the definition of H. So we can actually eliminate C from the right-hand side of this equation by redefining H in some way. And the answer that we get is some sub-algebra of this uh, Q-deformed SL2 thing, which uh, sounds pretty scary. Right? Um, so my message now is not to panic. Uh, the only thing you need to know about this Q-deformed algebra is uh, written by these three equations. So these are just three, th these are just four operators which satisfy these particular relations for our purposes. There's actually more structure to the algebra than the equations, but for our purposes, this will be enough. Um, and there's E plus and E minus roughly become L plus and L minus in some limit. And the difference of this K plus minus one uh, becomes L zero. So you should think of uh, this as just some deformation of the SL2 algebra. And um, this H algebra that I just mentioned, okay, becomes some sub-algebra of this particular algebra. So let me repeat that uh, just to be clear. So we do not, in general, find that the algebra is the quantum deformation of SL2. We instead find that it's some sub-algebra of, of this SL2. And in order to identify a particular sub-algebra, I've written the expressions. OK, so um, let me just say that uh, what we can start doing now is looking at the representations of this algebra. In particular, if we look at single particle states, so we had one chord in the wormhole and some number of chords to the left and right, we find unitary finite dimensional representations of the subalgebra. So this is a little bit funny because uh, SL2 you think is a non-compact group. It does not have uh, finite dimensional uh, unitary representations, but this is some quantum thing. And uh, you can actually very explicitly calculate and see that there are these finite dimensional representations of these particular uh, objects here. And that makes sense. So since uh, you're fixing the number of chords in the wormhole, you're just saying that there's like three chords and the possible locations of the particle are limited, right? So this is a direct consequence of the fact that there is something discrete in the bulk. Furthermore, we can find some Casimir, and that Casimir can be promoted to a uh, full Casimir of the algebra. Okay, so that was quite abstract. Uh, now we can relax a little bit and discuss some uh, more concrete things. So let me try to give you some feel for the algebra by focusing on a particular generator, which is this momentum generator. Okay, so it's the difference between HLR and HLR. So first of all, this thing here, remember, it basically creates a left chord and annihilates a right chord. So this thing here is just a sort of discrete translation operator, right? It, it removes one of the left chords and puts it back on the right. So that moves the matter particle uh, in the worm. Now, you, one thing, question that you can ask is what happens as I act with this translation operator on a particle in the wormhole? So this is some finite space. Remember, there's only a finite number of chords. So what happens to, if I act with momentum uh, in a finite space, right? It seems like a weird thing. And well, one proxy for that is to calculate the spectral form factor of this P operator. And what you see is that there's a recurrence. So that's what happened is you had the particle in the middle of the wormhole, let's say. You act with momentum, that translates it somewhere in the wormhole, and eventually it comes back to the middle. Somehow that is a symmetry of this bizarre uh, uh, limit to S like K. Now, furthermore, we can examine the microscopic expression for P. So the expression of P in terms of fundamental fermion. And to do that, we just uh, translate all those algebra things into these concrete expressions involving the size operator N and T left and T right, which are the Hamiltonian. 
So this gives some microscopic expression for, let's say, the generator. And uh, we see that it's roughly speaking a commutator of the size with the p left minus p right. Okay. That's uh, true in some particular cases. And in particular, in the particular cases which is true, we can use it to uh, derive, for example, the Chi and Stryker formula for the growth operator size. So you can think of the uh, growth operator size as a consequence of the chord algebra. Uh, and that was known in the case of JT gravity, so at the very low temperature limit. But here we're showing that it's uh, for finite temperature. So finite temperature uh, growth of size, which is sub-maximal in general, is reproduced by this funny algorithm. OK, now we can do, we can play various games. So we can take various contractions of this algorithm. So uh, one thing that we can do uh, is take Q fixed and n bar goes to infinity. So that's the limits where we're going to very low temperatures and we get a very long wormhole. Then this group contracts something. And also we take the limits where uh, the length is fixed, but Q goes to one. The frac Q goes to one. Uh, that is the sort of standard SYK limit, remember. And then we can do both of them and then get the standard discussion of the triple scaling limit. So let's first start there where this uh, discussion is most familiar perhaps. So if we go all the way to the bottom right, we get uh, the isometries of nearly ADS2, which are just the near horizon symmetries of a near extremal black hole. Uh, here we've just constructed them explicitly. So um, the expressions for those uh, generators, the boost, the momentum, and the global time translation are given by these microscopic expressions. Right? Okay, they are gauge invariant symmetries. They move matter with respect to the Schwarzen boundary while leaving the length of the world. Now, plugging in our triple uh, scaled expressions for the left and right Hamiltonian, we can get some very concrete expressions for how they act, let's say, on a single particle. Okay, and the only important thing that I want you to know is that they act very concretely in terms of this variable x, which is the distance from the midpoint of the probably the bifurcate horizon. Okay. So x is just the location of the particle, and these elementary expressions act on wave functions of x, and you can check uh, in about two minutes that uh, this algebra is satisfied. With the now, when we include finite lambda uh, corrections, this uh, symmetry group gets deformed into the quantum group, U, Q, S, L, Q. Okay, so um, the, the thing to, to say is that you get the full quantum group in this particular limit and goes to fit. We're now discussing the upper right thing where n bar is infinite. And in that limit, you get the full quantum group. But when you get n finite, you did not get the full quantum group. So uh, that describes the low temperature but finite lambda symmetries of double scaled SYK. And it's an interesting. Uh, thing, this quantum group, because it has more structure than just the algebra. So it, it has this thing called the, it's actually a hot algebra, and the multi-particle states actually use some of the features of this algebra. Um, perhaps more conventionally, we can focus on the standard large Q limit of SYK. So this is just the conventional, without double scaling, limit where we take lambda goes to zero, but hold temperatures fixed. So holding temperatures fixed, is equivalent to holding the length of the wormhole fixed, right? So at finite temperatures, the length of the wormhole is held fixed. And that uh, gives us some other thing. Now, this other thing that it gives us is a bit of a surprise. So in particular, just by plugging in the concrete expressions that we have, we get uh, this particular algebra, uh, this particular expression for P, B, and E, which you see are identical to the ones in the previous slide, except for this factor of C. So in particular, we still get uh, the SL2 algebra even at finite temperature. And uh, what's interesting is that the only modification is the factor of 1 minus c squared multiplying e, which can be reabsorbed uh, into the definition of e. Okay. This factor of 1 minus c squared is, uh, uh, is an important thing. So c, remember, is, the, is related to the length of the wormhole. And that thing is being held fixed. Um, So this immediately poses two questions. Okay. So the first question is, we found an SL2 symmetry, but chaos is submaximal. So what did? And second, uh, is there a hyperbolic space on which the symmetry acts as some isometry of that space? Okay. So we're trying to understand now the bulk dual of standard large Q SYK. Um, is there a sense in which it's still hyperbolic, despite being at finite temperatures? So 
despite being far away, let's say, from the Schwartzian dimension. We could even be talking about nearly infinite time. Okay, so um, the answer is, uh, in order to answer that, we can work out the action of the generators of the states. We can work out the action of the generators on some particularly special state. So these are states where we inserted a matter operator at some Euclidean time in the past. And in this particular limit, we can evaluate the action of the, of the symmetries by using the fact that the symmetries just involve this link. And this link is com computed by the size. And the size, therefore, just gives us the, the four-point function. So we just need to know the OTOC in the standard large Q model. And thankfully, that was already computed in various papers. So if we know the OTOC, we can work out the action of the symmetry generators on these boundary states. And what we find is that the answers are quite simple if we introduce something that we call the fake hyperbolic disk. So the fake hyperbolic disk is engineered to reproduce the correct two-point function of large QSYK. So in large QSYK, um, the answer to the two-point function is just this factor here. Um, and it looks like the conformal answer, except that you have to rescale time in a certain way. And this hyperbolic disk is designed such that you rescale the time in the appropriate way to reproduce the two-point function. So in particular, um, u equals zero is here, and beta over two is over here. So the total circumference of the space is not beta, but it's something else which has been engineered to get the two-point function. OK? So the dash part is, in some sense, unphysical. But however, when we introduce this picture, the answer that we get for the symmetry generators are quite simple. They act as time reparameterizations of this boundary uh, fake time, OK, phi. And these are just uh, the standard SL2 boundary time reparameters. Furthermore, we can then compare uh, the action on the boundary with the action in the bulk. Doing so gives us a formula for where x of the particle is uh, as a function of phi. So this was all defined, let's say, from the microscopic theory, right? It was defined in terms of core numbers and so forth. We did an honest calculation of this thing, and we found that the answer was reproduced by a hyperbolic geometry calculation where we start with the fake disk and we demand that the geodesic ends on the slice with a right angle. So uh, that's quite, that was a bit of a surprise to us. Furthermore, there's some missing region here in this picture, and it seems like uh, we can actually solve the inner product in this particular region. We find that the inner product has this factor of the global time translation, which exactly accounts, uh, some factor of the inner product accounts for the missing region. Okay, so it seems like the middle region is somehow associated with the inner product, although we don't have a great understanding of that. Um, as a final comment, I will say that the total circumference of the space is exactly matches what we would have ex expected from the chaos exponent. So the chaos exponent uh, is related to the, the, the fake uh, periodicity of this fake space, okay? But uh, all these effects seem to align. So these were all basically discovered experimentally by doing this whole like microscopic uh, algebra stuff, uh, doing a bunch of chord combinatorics. Uh, but the output is consistent with uh, this sort of uh, fake hyperbolic disk, where we actually have some negative global U Euclidean time evolution. So, um, it's quite strange. Um, but uh, maybe the fake disk is not so fake. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. OK, so let me end with a summary. So, uh, the core diagrams can be sliced open in some way um, to define a bulk Hilbert space. And this bulk Hilbert space um, is essentially just uh, interpreted as the link. So uh, when you have matter particles at the various locations, you're really building up a Hilbert space by specifying where the matter particles roughly are uh, in the middle of this core diagram. So uh, I would say that this is as close as it gets to some, some sort of explicit derivation of holography in admittedly a very toy model. Uh, furthermore, um, we found that using the scored Hilbert space picture and asking about its symmetries constrains the possible uh, bulk matter, the interpretation of the bulk matter in this theory. So in particular, the bulk matter transforms under this funny uh, quantum deform deformed version of SLT. So the, the Hilbert space can be organized into representation of this funny group. Um, and we did not discuss it, but uh, the bulk to boundary map can be made very concrete. So there's some algorithm that you could put into Mathematica. If you tell me you want you know, some matter particle with some particular state, uh, some particular location in the wormhole, 
state. I can put that in mathematics and tell you some boundary expression for what that state is. Um, so that's a bulk to boundary reconstruction that works even when the Schwarzian fluctuations are large, they could be small, they could, the Q deformation parameter could be large, it could be small. So it's some very uh, sort of fancy bulk reconstruction. Uh, the analog in super Yang Mills would be like doing a bulk reconstruction that uh, includes all stringing corrections, right? So uh, this works well in a regime where the chaos exponent could be quite small. So uh, we are getting perhaps closer to an uh, understanding of the bulk dual, and perhaps there are also some general lessons for submaximal chaos. Thanks very much. Could you elaborate on the role that the this other Hulk algebra structure plays? Yeah, sure. You have two particles which transform under SU2. The total angular momentum is the sum of the first angular momentum and the second. So that's true for Lie algebras. It is not true for these uh, quantum groups. So in particular, um, the tensor product of two quantum groups has this funny effect that uh, you need to do something nonlinear to the analog angular momentum. Um, that thing is called a coproduct. And the coproduct uh, of SL2Q uh, is some well-defined expression in terms of these, uh, uh, in terms of the SL2Q of the first factor and the second factor. Now, uh, when you have two particles in the wormhole, the expressions for um, these symmetry generators, you can check from the microscopic definition, agree with the Hopf algebra sort of definition, the coproduct. So in other words, um, you could say that this, like, uh, the symmetries don't act uh, linearly on the matter particles in this quantum group. Uh, they don't act linearly on the matter particles. Uh, so you can't really say that uh, you transit the first particle and you transit the second particle separately. Uh, but there is some generalization of that that holds, and that's what, that's what we know about it. So some, a little bit more of the cutiform structure than just the algebra. Um, um, sir, I, I always get confused because this, this symbol Q gets defined a whole bunch of, yes. bunch yes. of times. Track of it. So yes. if, I, if I want to compare this to like say n equals four, yes. What? So presumably you're at large n, but sort of what values of lambda are we talking about? Yeah. Okay. Good. So um, the analogy for infinite n n equals four super yang mill is that we uh, take q goes to one, so frac q goes to one, lambda goes to zero. Okay. However, we keep the temperature finite. So finite temperature means like keeping the springy correction. In, in the analogy to super Yang Mills, the finite temperature is like the uh, string, keeping the stringy effects in super Yang because the chaos exponent is finite. So, but this is still a limit where the theory completely factor, like there's still large n factorization, but uh, there's some uh, sub, sub maximal chaos. So that's the extent of the analogy. Yeah, big floppy strings. But um, you see, that's exactly the question which we were trying to understand, which is uh, you don't expect in this limit to have any geometry. Uh, any geometrical picture in general, right? A big floppy screen. Yeah, but here we seem to find some sort of weird geometry involving this big Yes, can you speculate about whether or not this phenomenon happens, say, in any close four? Like, for example, the length becoming discrete or something? Or... Uh, I'm not comfortable speculating. <laughs> it were true, but. Uh... Uh, when we consider integrability on the string worksheet, it looks like the length becomes discrete. I don't know if this connects with the width. Other question, if I may? So, you thought that the SYK model perhaps was not the local theory in the bulk? Oh, suppose you, you do this and you then find the interactions between the bulk particles and yes, so on. Yes. So, the question is whether you are indeed finding a local theory. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think one sub-variant of that question that we tried to address is whether we really get, even in the JT limit, mass, massive fields, let's say massive free fields. Now. So um, I would say qualitatively, it, it sounds promising. 
However, one thing that we're trying to understand in detail is whether you get, for example, a Klein global norm. So, you know, whether the particles, so there's some wave function psi of x, right? And we have some inner product that uh, tells you how to complete the overlap state. And one question we'd like to know is whether this inner product has an interpretation. <laughs> from the core diagram? Yes. Uh, the local amplitude. Um, well, the OTOC has been calculated, and it has this funny case uh, that is uh, disgusting. Where people put, uh, the OTOC is not just a P times Q, you know, like the gravitational scattering. Uh, it's a bit like the stringy. I times P, Q, some power, you get some phase back. So, in that sense, there's some sort of non domain. Uh, I don't know how that statement relates to any of these core discussions. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's what these are. But in this limit, the action becomes this local Lorentzian union action. But it's still a local action. Well, I don't think that the legal action has a clear bulk interpretation. In terms of the <laughs> Isn't the solution to the Liouville equation precisely the large Q? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to go from. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I don't. I personally don't know how to go from say some description of say for example matrix Q with some Lagrangian involving massive field. I think the best thing that we know how to do is to do these four things and like use this Hilbert space and compare them with the Hilbert space and get the, let's say three particles. That that's the thing that we know how. To it may be possible, I just don't know how to do it. So your, your big disk, uh, does it give some geometric explanation of why the energy spectrum is bounded in the scale? Why energy? Yeah. Not immediately. But yeah, I, I, one thing you can say is, what is the period of the disk at very high energies? So at very high energies, it's basically inverse phase, like uh, so this this uh, fake disk um, does not go to zero. In some sense, the chaos exponent and so forth, uh, you know, stays finite at the high, and that seems to be related. That's the best that I can. 